All right, so today we're talking about how did the age of exploration and the commercial revolution affect Europe and the Americas? So you're going to have to bear with me today because it's going to sound a little bit like we're in AP World History instead of AP European History. Some of this may already sound familiar from you from World History. But so, first question. What economic changes contributed to the commercial revolution? So a commercial revolution is just a revolution in commerce and commerce is trade. And this is going to be something that's going to happen um, as a result of the Renaissance, which is stuff we've been going over um, in class already. So one of the reasons why there was a commercial revolution is because there was a population increase in the 16th century. The population increases by about 20 million. Um, there's a rise in prices uh, because of the population growth. There's an increased demand for food. Um, less fertile land begins to be put into cultivation in order to um, grow more food, but that means to it, that leads to an increase in the cost of production because the land isn't that fertile and more things have to be done to it in order to get the crops to grow. We also start to see, though, a commercial revolution and a rise in, cap in a capitalistic economy, uh, particularly centering in the Netherlands and in Britain. Um, so we start to see a transition from a town centered to a nation centered economic system. So rather than just being, you know, very much a local economy that you see in the Middle Ages with trade being, fo you know, trade being focused between uh, local farms and, the, you know, the small towns, we start to see a larger scale um, economic system begin to develop. And this really begins about the 14th century up until the, revolu the Industrial Revolution of the 18th century. Now, the commercial revolution, of course, is going to be the th one of the, the tip-offs for what we know as the age of exploration. So that's where we're going to kind of start begin to focus on now. So just give you a little bit of background. And again, a lot of this is going to sound or should be very familiar to you um, from AP or AP World. So we know that the Europeans were not the first ones to explore. We know that the Europeans are not the first ones to be trading. We know that there was a very vibrant trade network going along the Silk Road, going across the Indian Ocean. When you think in the 600 to 1450 time period for AP World, you really think of an Asian-centered world um, where the Islamic empires being a major trading factor, as is India, as is East Africa, as is China. Um, we do start to see Europe begin to get involved in this, partly in some ways because of people like Marco Polo and his father traveling to China in 1271, bringing back all of these things of what's going on in China. We also start to see that expansion becomes a state enterprise, meaning a lot of these first explorations that we see, like for instance, you know, um, Christopher Columbus, that is funded by the state of Spain. They're the ones who are funding it for and Isabella. We also are starting to see better seaworthy ships. Part of that is because of the invention of the Caravel, um, which was a much faster ship. Also, um, the Latin, Latin sail, which allows for um, to tack against the wind. So Portugal is becoming a consolidated state in 1385. They are the first people um, in Europe to really trade on a worldwide scale. We were talking about this in AP World the other day because we were talking about the scramble for Africa and we were talking about how it was the Portuguese that were the first ones to begin exploring and colonizing Africa because they had, you know, Prince Henry the Navigator and they had um, the School of Navigation that was set up by Prince Henry who encouraged cartography um, and shipbuilding and going out and exploring the world. So one of the reasons why... Um, the Portuguese and then later the Spanish, the French and the British and the Dutch um, wanted to begin trading is they wanted to cut out the Arab Muslim middleman and also to cut out the Italians because at this point trade from Asia was coming in either through the Indian Ocean or along the Silk Road coming into the Middle East and then being transported from the Middle East uh, primarily by Italian merchants and the Spanish and the Portuguese did not like um, to be doing business with Muslims because of the whole uh, Inquisition and the Reconquista. And also they didn't like the fact that it, the Italians were making tons of money off of this and they wanted to find ways to make money for themselves. So that's why we see um, Bartolomé Diaz rounding the Cape of Good Hope and Vasco da Gama eventually going around to India, um, Cabral going over to Brazil, and Magellan beginning to, well, he was credited with the first one to circumnavigate the globe, but he really isn't since he dies in the Philippines. 
So, but of course, we know prior to this, the Chinese were avid explorers as well. Um, and you've seen this picture before in AP World comparing one of Columbus's ships to one of the 60 ships that Zheng He would have been traveling with um, across the Indian Ocean. So we know that there was already wide-scale exploration going on prior to the Europeans getting involved. So that's kind of why we are at this question here, which I kind of already started to address. So here you can see this is a quick timeline. You don't have to bother writing it down, but this is a timeline kind of showing you the different countries that were involved. Um, so it was the Italians, and then became the Portuguese, and then the Spanish, and this, the Spanish kind of had a long reign, and then the British came in, and the French came in. So some of the motives for European exploration. Part of it, like I mentioned before, would be the Crusades, this, this intention to bypass um, the intermediaries, being both the Italians and the Muslims. Uh, the Renaissance, creating this curiosity about other lands and people. The Reformation, which I had said in class before, you know, it becomes a a race over who can convert the most people to either Catholicism or Protestantism. Monarchs are also seeking new sources of venue, uh, revenue. Excuse me. There's also huge technological advances, and I'll talk about those in a second, and just the desire of fame and fortune that comes along with being able to discover these things. So some of the maritime technology that was going to contribute to this is going to be things like map, cartography, the astrolabe. Now remember, the astrolabe allows you to... Uh, plot your latitude and latitude, latitude, the longitude and latitude using the stars. The compass obviously allows you to uh, find north. Now, of course, remember the the Chinese had that long before they called it the South Pointing Needle uh, during the Tong Song period. They had actually invented the compass, but it takes a little bit longer for the Europeans to get it. And then the sextant, which also helps in navigation. So again, some of the new weapons technology um, and shipping technology, in particular the caravel and the Latin sale. And then also the pistols and the guns, um, which also would have gotten, would have come through China because of course the Chinese were the ones to invent gunpowder, the Chinese were the first to make any type of firepower. So Prince Henry the Navigator, who was the brother of the King of Portugal, is the person who kind of opened the school for navigation in 1419. This is actually a museum. This is not my picture. I have no idea who that man is in this picture. I just found off the internet. I've never been to Portugal. It's on my list. This is the Museum of Navigation in Lisbon, Portugal. So the Portuguese Empire explores the west coast of Africa. Um, Vasco de Gama goes to Calcutta, and then um, Admiral Alfonso de Albuquerque goes to Goa and goes to Malacca, um, which are both in India. So we can see here the route of the um, of Diaz and of de Gama, and then also of Christopher Columbus later. So. How did the, how did Spain try to catch up with Portugal? So, I mean, little tiny Portugal making all this money, you know that the Spanish aren't going to allow this just to kind of lie for a long period of time. The Spanish are definitely going to want to get involved, involved themselves. So the Spanish looked to Portugal's wealth and they wanted it for themselves. And Ferdinand and Isabella in particular felt obligated morally to spread the Catholic faith. They thought this was their destiny. So Christopher Columbus, of course, comes with this idea not and not so new everyone knew that pretty much it was accepted knowledge that the world was round but he had this idea that if you sail because the world is round if you sail west you'll make it east um of course his major problems um in his voyages that he makes first off he always thought he reached the indies being indonesia which is why the caribbean is sometimes referred to as west indies but his major problem of course is that he grossly underestimated the circumference of the earth that's why he had insisted that's why he thought he had found um East, you know, Southeast Asia when he found these areas. It really isn't until an Italian, Americus Vespucci, who sails down the coast of South America that it's acknowledged that this is, in fact, not the Indies. This is someplace completely different, and that's why it's North and South America and not North and South Colombia. So here you can see these are some of the other voyages, uh, different groups of people, um, so you can see the ones that are marked G, those are the voyages of Vespucci. Um, so once it's realized that this is something completely different, 
then this sets off a frenzy of exploration and conquest because the Europeans each want to be the ones to grab as much land as possible. And Portugal really just did not have the people for a large-scale migration. They had no way to enforce or impose their way of life on the natives. So for Portugal, their primary purpose was trade, and that's why they established merchant colonies, kind of like little scattered trading post colonies throughout the world. The Portuguese crown would receive one-third of all the goods coming back to Portugal. The one area they did get to control in the New World, of course, is Brazil. Um, but the Brazilian population, one of the reasons why the Portuguese were able to pull it off is the native population of Brazil was very small. It was very nomadic. Um, so when the Portuguese came and tried to like enforce their will on them, a lot of them just were like, who the heck are you? We don't want anything to do with you. And they just moved further into the jungle, the rainforest. Um, and that's why the Portuguese realized that this was a place that was good for growing various different crops that they've been encountering in Asia, but in order to do that, they were going to need a large workforce, which is why it's the Portuguese that start the slave trade from Africa. So, of course, that's Ferdinand Magellan, first one to circumnavigate the world, and here we start to see all these various different Atlantic voyages that begin to happen. Um, so, of course, the Spanish are the ones who conquer most of South America. So this is Fernando Cortez, who takes over the Aztecs. Um, he captures Montezuma and has him killed. So that's images of the death of Montezuma. Mexico is going to surrender to Cortez. And then in the Incas, it's Francisco Pizarro. Um, and so here, these are slaves working in a Brazilian sugar mill, because like I said, sugar is going to be the major crop for Brazil. They're not going to have any labor because there was a small population in Brazil to begin with. And so they're going to bring in workers from Africa. Now, this began a conflict between the Portuguese and the Spanish. They began to fight over land. So the Pope decided that he had to step in. Um, and that is the Treaty of Tordesillas, which was in 1494, which set up um, the line, what's referred to as the line of demarcation, which gave half the world to Spain and half the world to Portugal. Now, note at the time, the Pope which Pope Alexander VI, who of course is Spanish, which is why he supports Spain over Portugal. And also note the fact that it's really quite, I'm trying to think of the word, rude, um, condescending, I guess, to assume that you as the Pope can just divide up the whole world, thinking about all the people who live in Asia and the Americas. But that's kind of the attitude of the Europeans at the time. So here we start to see uh, the Spanish and French, uh, excuse me, French, the Spanish and Portuguese colonies that begin to develop um, in strategic parts around the world. And this is one of the reasons why Philip II is going to be so powerful, although, as I said in the previous video, does not spend his money very wisely. So how did exploration affect the political, economic, and social structure of the world? So Spain is going to come in and impose their rule on societies that in some instances are more populous and more complex than their own. Because when you think about the Incas and Tenochtitlan, Tenochtitlan is the largest, one of the largest cities in the world. It puts all of the cities in Spain to complete shame as far as the complexity of it, as far as how large it is. Um, but the Spanish, remember, they thought of themselves as the extension of God's rule on earth. And they believed that they could... Um, convert these people to Christianity, and that was really their job. So basically, Mexico and Peru were ruled as kingdoms, you should know this all from AP World, with viceroys. Viceroy means vice king. All the colonial appointments were made by the king and the Council of Indies back in Spain. So the government, trade, communication, everything was centralized. In the beginning, the first settlers, we start to see what was known as the encomienda system develop in which the conquistadors were, it's, were given the job of protecting and giving religious instruction to the natives in return for labor. The system largely failed, and there's a couple of reasons why it failed. First off, the people that were conquistadors were not exactly Spain's best and brightest. A lot of them were kind of like lowlifes trying to kind of, well, or seen by the Spanish as being lowlifes and trying to kind of improve their social status. So the Spanish king needed to reward them with something for doing this, you know, deed for Spain. However, they didn't want to create a new aristocracy amongst this group of people that they felt really weren't worthy to be aristocracy. So therefore they were given, they weren't given the encomiendas for an indefinite period of time. They weren't allowed to pass it on to descendants. They were given it to for a set period of time. So what that meant is 
it allowed for a lot of exploitation of the Native Americans because those people that had that land for that brief period of time wanted to make as much money as they possibly could off of the land. So the result is it's about 90% of the Native Americans are die, die either by disease or by um, overwork. Um, and the Spanish actually did believe that the Native Americans were rational human beings and they did not feel that they could be enslaved. So they actually kind of pulled back on the cruelties of the encomienda system. Of course, it didn't stop them from inflicting another whole set of cruelties on the African people, but that's another story. Um, so Africa and Asia did benefit in some ways from the trade, but the native, econ native economies were very much harmed because the Spanish and the Portuguese are taking all the surplus, surplus wealth and bringing it back to their home country. Now, one of the major uh, effects of the Age of Exploration is something referred to as the Columbian Exchange. Why would the Columbian Exchange, you don't have to write this down as a question, but why would the Columbian Exchange be considered the tsunami of unintentional bioterrorism? Well, the Columbian Exchange leads to all of these various different goods being crisscrossed across the globe. Some of them are good, and some of them are not so good. So the disease would be the not so good because smallpox, of course, is one of the main reasons why so many of the Native Americans die. And the Native Americans brought lovely diseases like syphilis into Europe. Um, however, we also see a profound change in the, the population of Europe and even Asia as a result of the Columbian Exchange because of things like the potato. Um, the potato could be grown with minimum labor in cool, damp climates until the great potato famine had thought to be essentially famine proof. It could feed thousands of workers and it was relatively, it was pretty nutritiously dense. So basically, this is what's going to feed the workers of the Industrial Revolution. This is what's going to feed um, the poor Irish in Ireland as the rest of their land is being used for the production of grain for the English. This is even what's going to feed people in India, and this is even what's going to feed people in China. And this is why we're going to see a population increase happen as a result of this. If you think about the Southernization article that I made you read in ninth grade, you'll remember that many of the crops that were grown in the Eastern, hem in the Eastern Hemisphere, like sugar, like coffee, these crops be brought, are being brought over to the Western Hemisphere, and they become hugely profitable crops. So what this does is it increases the volume of world trade, it increases the European money supply. So in regards to the cycle of colonization, we have the explorers come in, then the conquistadors, then the missionaries, then the permanent settlers, and then the area becomes an official colony. Now, this is some of the value of gold and silver that's being brought back to Europe during this time period. The transatlantic slave trade starts as a result, like I said before, during this time period. So this existed in Africa before the coming of the Europeans, but the Portuguese replaced European slaves with Africans because there were slaves in Europe as well. Um, so sugarcane and sugar plantations were the major source need for labor. The first boatload of African slaves were bought by the Spanish in 1518. Um, between the 16th and 19th century, about 10 million Africans shipped to the Americas, but remember I was saying in world history, I've seen it as high as 15 million. So the numbers vary. Remember this, they were pushed into these um, ships as tightly as they possibly could to fit as many people as they possibly could. Um, anyone who got sick was thrown overboard. Sharks actually would follow the slave ships looking to eat people that were being thrown overboard. Bottom line, Exploration, at least for the Native Americans, it really completely destroys um, the traditional American culture. Um, so the Native Americans were forced into accepting Christianity. Temples were destroyed, cities were destroyed, and then they were rebuilt um, according to Spanish designs. Um, intermarriage between the Spanish and the Americans was supported and encouraged to increase, to weaken the cultural identity of the Native Americans, creating a whole class of people as referred to as mestizos. Um, for the most part, the Spanish were successful. However, the old ways did survive as folk law and through synchronism and the blending of Christianity, but it led to a long scale legacy of resentment amongst the groups. So here you can see the influence of the Catholic Church, Our Lady of Guadalupe, which of course is the patron saint of Mexico. And of course, Bartolomé de las Casas is the Spanish priest who 
spoke up for the plight of the Native Americans, but his replacement for labor, of course, was the African. So good for the Native Americans, very bad for the Africans. Um, now, the Portuguese, like I said before, lack the numbers and the wealth to dominate the trade in the Indian Ocean. Uh, Spain in Asia really only kind of focused on the Philippines, but then we start to see the English explorations begin into the Indies um, and the Dutch begin to arrive in India. So the Spanish and the Portuguese uh, begin to get competition pretty soon into, into um, exploration. So the impact of exploration. Native American populations are completely ravaged by disease. Huge amount of gold, especially silver, coming into Europe really kind of trashing the whole economy of Spain in the end result, um, the Colombian exchange, and of course the really deepening of colonial rivalries. And of course when we think about this from a world history perspective, when we talk about this time period of 1450 to 1750 in world history, we always talk about how this is the time period when the two hemispheres finally meet. This is truly a time period of global trade and interaction for the first time. Um, so how was Europe changed by exploration? You know, from world history, how Latin America was changed by exploration. So now think about how was Europe changed by exploration?